Thank you, Chris. That's, um, I hope a good summary of what I'm about to say to you. Um, we have been talking about stewardship and money for the last several weeks, and I've heard it said, I'm sure you have as well, that uh, the three things you never talk about in polite society are religion, politics, and money. Um, I don't know what type of company you keep. I suppose that you keep that rule. Uh, but we're not going to do that in St. Matthews because we're not a polite society. <laughs> I hope that we're polite to each other, but we're not a polite society. In fact, may God save us from the folly, even the foolishness, of thinking we're simply a polite society, a polite gathering of people. We are family. More importantly, we are God's family. And a healthy family knows how to talk about these three subjects, religion, politics, and money, in an open, a forthright, and honest way. So let's continue our discussion. But before getting to stewardship and money, I, don't, I think it would be unwise if I rush past the declaration, God has made us family without offering an explanation of what that means. Our ability to be responsible, loving, and to have a fruitful conversation with each other about stewardship rests on the fact that we are indeed a family. And I want us to come to a better understanding of that today. So, like I said, let's spend a few minutes talking about it. In doing so, let's turn our attention back to the second reading that we heard today, the reading from the letter to the Hebrews. In our reading from Hebrews, the author quotes the prophet Jeremiah. Hello, come on in. <laughs> the author quotes from the prophet Jeremiah. And I want to read again that quote. I'm going to read a little bit more than what the author of Hebrews puts in. Here, this is in a fuller length what it says. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with my people, with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant of old, when I brought the people out by a mighty hand from Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this covenant that I will make with the house of Israel will be a better one. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people and I will remember their sins no more. Jeremiah utters this prophecy in a very dark period of Israel's history. But he sees a better day coming, and that this new covenant will mark that better day with God's people. Covenant. It's a very, very important word in Christianity. In fact, the best way to understand the Bible, which is really a long narrative, a long story about redemption, about God's salvation of His creation, the best way to read it is through the lens of covenant. In fact, you can't understand the Old Testament without understanding covenant. And if you don't understand the Old Testament, you won't understand the new. You won't understand who Jesus is. You won't understand the purpose for which he came and why he said the things he said. And you won't understand how the Bible is relevant to your life. What's more, talking about covenant is so closely linked with the understanding of what a family is in the Bible that the two go hand in hand. So we have to get clear 
on this idea of covenant. Two weeks ago, just as Chris stood here and spoke to you so well today, Steve Sale spoke, and he shared a little bit about his life, and I think um, this is a good way to get into talking about covenant. What he said was this, when he returned to going back to church in a faithful and consistent way, he started to give money. But um, giving of his money, he had this underlying assumption, which was this, that he was rendering goods for services provided. He thought of his giving as an exchange of goods and services. In other words, Steve understood himself to be in a sort of contractual agreement with his church. Now, I don't fault Steve for thinking this way. Uh, none of us should. I mean, we all enter into contact contractual agreements all the time. Just think about the agreement you have with uh, your phone provider. We do these things all the time. But Steve went on to tell us that the more time he spent gathering with Christians, with his fellow Christians, and worshiping with worshiping God, the more he began to suspect that his underlying assumption was wrong. In fact, he came to understand that he wasn't in a contractual relationship with the church, but that he was growing into an intimate relationship with God. He began to see that all that he has, all of his talents, all of his gifts, all of his personal wealth, is really a gracious gift from God. In other words, Steve began to see that his giving is part of a covenant relationship with God. Let's go deeper with covenant. Here's another way to get at it. God's desire is for us to be fully alive. I think of St. Irenaeus' great words, glory of day is vivens homo. The glory of God is a human being fully alive. And another way to say this is that God wants to give us his life by uniting us to himself. A human being who is fully alive is a human being who has entered into union with God. That's what God desires for us, for us to be partakers of his divine nature. In order to do this, God establishes a covenant with his people. So far from the biblical notion of covenant being an exchange of goods and services, a biblical covenant is like the bond of marriage. In marriage, the bride and the groom say to each other, I will be yours and you will be mine. That's a wonderful summary of what God says when he makes covenant with his people. I will be your God and you will be my people. Now the way almost always that covenant is established by God in the Bible is through a blood sacrifice. Blood sacrifice it seems arcane to our ears, I know, but it's very important. Why? Well, blood represents life. It not only represents life, but it transmits life. There is no life without blood. So in the blood sacrifice, think of what Abraham offered the sacrifice, when Moses offered blood sacrifice. In that sacrifice, there is a recognition of something going on, and that is the exchange of life. You see, that's what covenant is all about. It's not an exchange of goods and services. It's an exchange of life. God is giving his life to us, to his people, and he desires our lives in return. You know, there's a magnificent representation of this in the Old Testament. It's called Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. 
Each year, the high priest would enter into the tabernacle or temple and go to the most holy place in that tabernacle, the place where heaven and earth met, God's dwelling among his people. That place is the Holy of Holies, the most sacred place. And the priest would sprinkle, shed blood on the mercy seat. And that was done to signify that Israel was repenting of their sins and saying, we know, God, that you have entered into a covenant relationship with us and we've not kept our part of the covenant. They realized they were sinners. They had failed to live up to the demands of the covenant and so blood sacrifice was required in order to renew that covenant. It signifies this, brothers and sisters, that when there is a broken relationship, in order to repair that relationship, it hurts. It costs something. The cost is significant. And that was symbolized with the shedding of blood. You know, scholars say that when an ancient Israelite would approach the tabernacle or the temple with their blood, their animal to be sacrificed, they were really saying, by all rights, this should be happening to me. Okay, what then about Jeremiah and the new covenant that he foresaw? Well, Jeremiah was a prophet and he knew well the covenants that God had established with his people. He knew about the law of Moses. He knew deeply within himself the sacredness of the law. He had seen hundreds of thousands of sacrifices take place. But listen, he also knew that this type of relationship, this type of relating to God was not working or it wasn't good enough. After all the sacrifices, Israel still did not completely belong to the Lord. And so, in that very difficult period of Israel's history, in Babylonian captivity, Jeremiah foresees a better day. Now, that, that'll preach on its own. In the darkest night of Israel's history, God gives his people a vision of a better day. In that time, he sees a new covenant. When the law of God would not just be written on stone tablets, but it would be written on the hearts of his people. Jeremiah is looking forward to the day when God and his people will completely belong to each other, when they will be a true family in union with each other. It may have seemed an impossible dream. It must have been in that time. But now let's move forward back to the author of Hebrews. You see, the author of Hebrews has the advantage of knowing that Jeremiah's prophecy has come to pass. Look again. Let's look again at the reading. The author writes, And every priest stands day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. You hear what the author is saying. He's bringing again to our mind the imagery of blood, of sacrifice, of the tabernacle, of the temple rituals, all that was necessary to renew again and again the covenant with God. But then he goes on. He says, but when Christ, when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down. Friends, he could sit down because he had completed his work at the right hand of God. And since then, he's been waiting until his enemies will be made a footstool, and they will be. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. There it is. Jesus' offering is the new covenant. In Jesus, the law of God has quite literally 
been written on a human heart. How is that? Because He is the Word made flesh. He is the Word incarnate. He is the law of God, the Torah of God in human flesh. And in order to get that law outside of His heart and into ours, Jesus sacrifices His life. He sheds His blood in order to establish a new covenant with us. But the blood of bulls and goats and sheep could not do is establish an everlasting covenant. But divine blood can, and it has. That's the author's point. Because Jesus is God in the flesh, his blood, when it is spilt, establishes a new and better covenant with us. We are now joined to God in intimate union through Jesus' blood sacrifice. What Jeremiah saw in existence has become a reality. Jesus was lifted up on the cross to bring the whole world back to God. And Jesus can do this because he is the perfect offering. He is the perfect unity between humanity and divinity. And now anyone and everyone can enter into this new covenant with God, can become a member of the family of God if they are willing to put their trust in Jesus. And so the author of Hebrews says, now that we're family, let us consider how to provoke each other, how to stir each other up to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the final day approaching. In other words, he is saying, I suppose if he were a Texan, he would say, y'all get together. Share God's divine life with each other. Share the things that you have. Give of yourselves. Give of your time. Give of your treasure, your wealth. Give and you'll have greater treasure to share. Give because all that you have and all that you are is first and foremost a gift from God. In the last two years, the leadership of St. Matthew's have asked a lot of you, a lot, for you to give a lot. Little more than a year has gone by since we began our capital campaign to improve this campus, the facilities, and you gave well. In fact, we met our pledge goal as far as what we were expecting from the congregation, and now we have reached roughly half of that total goal. We are working on gathering grants to finish and complete our goal. Each year we come to you and we ask you to make a pledge. And if you haven't already, you'll be receiving soon in the mail a newsletter addressed to you from me, asking you to prayerfully consider to give the young adult ministry. You see, Keely, I came to the cathedral knowing that initially anyway, I would not be paid a salary. All of these ways we're asking you to give, it may seem a lot at times, but I think it's really important for us to understand and to think about giving within the context of covenant relationship with God. If we just think about, well, we have to give to, to make salary, make payroll, keep the lights on, improve the building, uh, we're missing the mark. Yes, those things are included. But we give first and foremost out of our thankfulness to God. As Chris said so well at the beginning, we give because God has given so much to us. 
Because in Jesus Christ, God has torn down the wall of hostility that was between God and us. God has given us everything that he could, that he can give us, in giving us his own life through Jesus Christ. So one more final word about giving. It is to say this. Start where you're at. If you have been giving, I hope that you'll prayerfully consider giving more. If you haven't been giving, then start by giving a little bit and increase that giving incrementally. Remember, our giving is linked to being in covenant relationship with God. We are family. And we bring our gifts in here, whether they're talents or they're our wealth, ultimately in order that we might give this great truth away to the world, in order that we might tell the world, God has reconciled you by the shedding of his own blood in Jesus Christ. Friends, that's the greatest message anyone will ever hear, anyone can ever come to believe, and it's our great privilege and our great responsibility to do what we can in order to make sure that message is heard. I have said these words to you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.